So this, this week I want to discuss, uh, I want to finally de define what the categorical anti-spherical anti module is. And I want to discuss, to begin a discussion of um, its symmetries. So, And so this will start to take us in the direction of uh, some higher representation theory, i.e. the study of monoidal categories acting on categories. That was, this would be two representation theory. So just to remind us where we are and where we're hoping to get to, we, we're trying to explain the, the proof of the following theorem. Uh, which is the theorem of Arkhipov and Bezrel Kavnikov from 2008, which is that there exists an equivalence of triangulated categories between coherent sheaves on the equivariant coherent sheaves on the Steinberg variety and the anti-spherical module, categorical anti-spherical module, and this categorifies the statement that the G check times GM equivariant K theory of the Springer resolution. Sorry, I think I said Steinberg variety before I meant Springer resolution is the same thing as the so-called anti-spherical module for the affine Hecker algebra, which is this induced module. And as I've said before, this, this isomorphism of vector spaces is very simple. You can establish it in a few lines. Whereas this equivalence of triangulated categories is rather, rather deep. Uh, and last time we spent a lot of time discussing the Hecker category and the definition that we will use. And I just want to recall, so we're in the wonderful position now that I can't explain the proof of this theorem, but we will be able to say um, in detail what the statement of the theorem is, which we haven't been able to do properly for several weeks now. So I just want to recall from last time that we defined HFSS, and this stands for um, semi-simple, to be the additive category generated by IC complexes. So additive and closed under shift. This was inside the B times B equivariant derived category of G you say co K coefficients. So from that, for the rest of the course, K will be Q, R, or C. And we defined the Hecker category to be the homotopy category Of this category. So here, this is an additive category. So it consists of semi-simple complexes 
inside this ambient derived category. And so this, um, so this has an action of a, this has kind of two shift functors. This is the, um, the triangulated shift functor. And this shift functor is induced from the fact that I have a um, shift here uh, that comes from the triangulated structure here. Um, so just to draw you a picture, I mean, this is probably just to draw you a picture of what's going on. So if we take some object F inside here, F will be a complex of semi-simple complexes. So it'll have an F0 and F1. And each Fi is in um, semi-simple. And then our shift functor Our triangulated shift functor, as usual, shifts our complexes against the arrows, whereas our, our one would, well, I think about it as shifting the, so it doesn't change the position of something in the complex, but it shifts it up and down internally. And I think of my gradings kind of always go up, and so this would be a shift down. Okay, and so this is an, I, I just want to emphasize because this is important and confusing, I want to em emphasize it a few times. This is additive, not triangulated. And this is uh, triangulated. And we have the following theorem. So are there any questions based on this slide? This is basically recollection from last lecture, but it's important. So please don't hesitate to ask if. And if you would, so this is a rather algebraic kind of way of thinking about this category. It's a complex of semi-simple complexes. If you want to think about it more geometrically, then this thing is uh, something like half tape twist, and this is the normal triangulated structure. Um, okay, and the fact that I'm denoting this by one rather than a half is analogous to the fact that I, I use this V in my Hecker algebra, which is corresponds to something like q to the half or q to the minus a half. And the important theorem which I stated last time is that the map that sends BS to the class of ICS induces an ISO of between the Hecker algebra to the finite Hecker algebra this is isomorphic to the split growth in the group of. So the only reasonable growth in the group that it makes that it makes sense to take of an additive category is the split growth in the group. 
This is the split Grothendieck group. And it's a simple exercise to see that if you take the homotopy category of an additive category, then the Grothendieck group of the this homotopy category as a triangulated category agrees with the split Grothendieck group of the original additive category. So this is isomorphic to the Grothendieck group of H. So this means triangulated. Grothendieck group. Okay. So throughout, we'll think about this as being some useful skeleton of this, um, and I'm missing some sub Fs. And it's important to note that inside here, so under this isomorphism, The cardinalistic basis element, so this is for a simple reflection. The cardinalistic basis element goes to the class of the intersection cohomology complex. So this is the KL basis element. And so if there's no questions, I'll move on. So um, the same construction. In the affine case. Okay, all we're using is the kind of cat smoothie. So the same thing would work in any cat smoothie um, setting. So we define H semi simple to be the triangulated category generated by all the IC complexes on now on the affine flag variety. This is an additive. This is the additive category of semi simple complexes inside the DBI of the flag variety with K coefficients. Remember, the flag variety is G of T mod I, where this is the Yor Hori. And then we define. H to be the homotopy category. Of H semi simple. And the same theorem holds. So the Hecker algebra is the split growth in the group of semi simple complexes, and it's the same thing as the triangulated growth in the group of the homotopy category. And the Kajdanlitzik basis goes to Okay, so there's just no no essential difference here. Okay, so now I now we're in a position to define the um, spherical and antispherical modules, the categorical versions. So I'll do that now. Um, and you know, before I do that, I just need to recall how to realize these modules in a reasonable way 
um, via casualistic theory, how to realize the, the non-categorified versions via casualistic theory. So in the Hecker algebra, we have this relation. So this tells us that ds plus v equals zero. So the only one in any one dimensional module, ds has to act as either v inverse or minus v, which is the kind of quantization of the fact that in any um, one dimensional module for the vial group, a simple reflection has to act as either one or minus one. Uh, and recall that we defined, so I'm changing notation. Last time I was denoting the anti-spherical module by n. And so then I would like to denote its categorification by curly n but curly N is already taken, it's the nilpotent cone. And so I've switched notation a little bit and I note, denote the spherical module by M sphur and the anti-spherical module by M R sphur. And we make another slight switch of notation. Now we switch to right modules um, as this will be easier when we, in the archipop bezra kamnikov world. So this is, um, the induced module from of the trivial module. So here, in the trivial module, delta S acts as um, the inverse. So this is the trivial module at um, V equals one. And here the sign Here, delta S acts as minus V. Okay, so these are um, For compatibility with Archipop as we can be called. So there's just a sm small shift of notation and a small and a shift from left to right, but no essential difference to what we were doing before. And I just want to um, remark that from last time, not last time, um, maybe three lectures ago. We made this basic observation that um, M, that either the spherical or the anti-spherical module is the um, but we can write H as a tensor product is a tensor product of HF tensor L, where this is the lattice part. This is the lattice part in the Bernstein presentation. So Z, E plus or minus one, theta, lambda, where lambda is in overall co-characters. And so this just becomes, um, it's just isomorphic to the lattice part as modules over the lattice part.
Another way of saying this as, is that as modules over the lattice part, both the spherical and antispherical modules are free of rank one. And so this, this, this way of viewing the spherical antispherical modules as being free of rank one over the lattice part is the part that is compatible with the coherent side of the Langlands correspondence. So this is exactly the part that corresponds to line bundles on the Springer resolution. And line bundles on the Springer resolution are given exactly by this set here. So, so this, this way of understanding the spherical module you can, or the anti-spherical module, you can think of as being basically the coherent incarnation. And now we want another description of this, which is the constructible, in, the constructible way of viewing this module. And that's the following. We can write any So now we, we do something that involves the coxeta structure of our affine bio group and things involving the coxeta structure rather than the loop structure should be viewed as being constructible. Kind of incarnations of the constructible side. So we can write any W in W as uh, as a, a finite part times a minimal coset representative, where this is in WF and this is in FW, which is minimal coset representatives reps for these something cosets. I can never remember whether this means left or right cosets, but whatever that is. Okay, so this tells us that we have an isomorphism. This implies that H is isomorphic to the finite Hecker algebra tensored with a direct sum. So now this is not a subalgebra anymore. Minimal coset representatives. So multiplication gives us such an isomorphism. So this provides us another way of cancelling the HF as we do up here. And so we deduce that M spherical or anti-spherical uh, has a has a basis consisting of dx, and I'll I'll just write superscript sphere or anti-spherical, which is just defined to be one tensor the image of the standard basis overall minimal coset representatives. Okay, and this we call the standard basis. So a fun exercise to do with this, well, it might, may, might depend on your definition of fun, but I find it amusing. And this is a particularly good exercise to do if you're not yet entirely happy with uh, affine vowel groups and etc. cetera. Uh, compute the bijection So we've seen in previous lectures that dominant alcoves 
are the same thing as minimal coset representatives, this upper F. And this is the same thing as lower F, what W? And W is the same thing as WF semi direct product, um, the root lattice. So this is just, sorry, the co-root lattice. So here we have a bijection between dominant alcoves and elements of the co-root lattice. So this bijection is rather, rather amusing. Uh, so for example, for SL2, this says that dominant alcoves, so this means natural numbers are in bijection with Z in some way, which is maybe not so surprising, but still not entirely trivial. Um, for SL3, it tells you that dominant alcoves are in bijection with the root lattice of SL3. And what does this bijection look like? So for every alcove, you can write an element of the root lattice inside it. And how do you do so? Okay, so now we go uh, into combinatorics until our break at, for tea time. Uh, basically combinatorics of the casualistic basis. Are there any questions so far? And also I'm probably at this stage being a little bit sloppy with um, simply connected, etc. but it should be recoverable from what I'm saying. Okay. So KL combinatorics. So our goal is to give simple descriptions in terms of the casualistic basis of the spherical and the anti-spherical module. And we'll do this based on basic observations about the casualistic basis. So the first exercise is the following. Amusingly, just after I'd written these notes, uh, Josh asked me exactly how to do one of the following exercises. So I said, look at the notes. Uh, so prove the following. A, suppose that I have any X in W and S in S, and, sorry, and any simple reflection. That if X, S is smaller than X, then, and I take the Kasha-Lutzig ele basis element and I multiply it by B, S, I get B plus V inverse times B, B, X. Um, the second exercise is that if T is another simple reflection and TS, TX takes X down and no assumptions and we just have um, S is arbitrary, then if we compute the Bx times Bs, we can write this in terms of casualistic basis elements. And then the claim is that if Ny is not zero, then Ty 
moves wide down. What's up? Uh, what was in the chat? Kx should be less than x. Thank you. So here we have some element that's taken down by t. And right multiplying that by s doesn't change the fact that everything here is taken down by t. That's what this is saying on the left. So this implies the very important fact that this set of bx such that tx is smaller than x span a right ideal. Okay, so now we have the um, realization of M of the spherical and anti spherical via Karshanitz theory. So the first statement is that the map that sends one tensor one to be WF. So WF always denotes the longest element of the finite bow group induces an ISO of the spherical module with the right ideal generated by the Kashlantic element corresponding to the longest element. So the spherical module sits inside the regular representation, the right regular representation in a very simple way. Um, the second thing is that the second statement, so that's how we, how we realize the spherical module. The anti-spherical module is realized in the following way. So the span of those Karshanlitzic elements which are not minimal in the left coset. So you can think about these as those alcoves which are not dominant is a right ideal. And note that this is an intersection of Sorry, this should be not. Note that this is an intersection of all of these. Ah. If we intersect this over all um, super reflections in the finite file group, we get exactly this. So this is a right ideal. It's an intersection of right ideals. Uh, so this span is a right ideal and uh, the anti-spherical module is isomorphic in a canonical way 
to the, the quotient. So. Okay, I'll just go, go through the proofs of these um, in some detail. I won't give all the details, but. Is there a question? Someone just turned their microphone on or off. Um, okay, so by the lemma, If we act on BWF times BS for S in a finite simple reflection, this will be equal to V plus V inverse times BWF. And remember that BS is delta S plus V. So this implies that BWF times delta S is um, v inverse times BWF. Okay. So this tells us that the, sim that the finite Hecker algebra acts on this longest element as it does on the trivial module. So Frobenius reciprocity gives us a map from the induced module to this right ideal. And now, if we look at where a standard basis element goes, This goes to B W F times Delta X. So remember a standard basis element necessarily corresponds to something that's minimal in its left coset. And so this is Delta W F X plus lower terms. And so now upper triangularity tells us that tells us that this map phi is an ISO. So that was part one. Part two, is that the lemma implies that this span of Bx where x is not minimal is an ideal. Is a right ideal. So now let's let's see how BS acts on one. So this is so for S a simple reflection. Um, and so so sorry in.
in the Hecker algebra modulo this right ideal, Bs is zero. So that tells us, I mean, Bs belongs to this set. S is not a minimal coset representative. So this is zero, and that's the same thing as uh, delta S plus V. So this implies that one times delta S is minus V um, times one in H mod this thing. So as before by Frobenius reciprocity, we get a map from M antispherical to H mod this idea. And now the same argument shows it's an isomorphism. It's an isomorphism. Okay. This, this side obviously has a basis given by cardinalistic elements corresponding to elements that are minimal. And that's upper triangular, upper triangular in the standard basis, which consists of delta x's for x minimal. So now, uh, just a remark. So here we can say that the spherical is a sub. An anti-spherical. is a quotient, which seems weird because the spherical and antispherical seem like rather symmetric things. So, but the other kind of non-invariant thing that we fixed here is, a, is the Cauchy-Lutzig basis. And uh, if you're familiar with Cauchy-Lutzig theory, you'll know that there's kind of two Cauchy-Lutzig bases. There's in the original Cauchy-Lutzig paper, these were denoted CX and CX prime. And if we were going to do this with the, um, with the primed basis, then the anti-spherical would be a sub and the spherical would be a quotient. So, just a remark. Is that Use the alternative KL basis. So this other Cajunistic basis will really start to uh, be very important when we come to discussing both IC complexes and tilting sheaves at the same time. But for the moment, I'll just say that if you use this uh, alternative KL basis, we, uh, we, we can realize M's for as a quotient and M antispherical as a sub. And this is categorified by causal duality. As I may or may not explain one day in this course, depending whether this course ever finishes. Uh, so we're now at a point where we have very natural definitions of the spherical and anti-spherical module. Um, so it makes sense to define. So I would define. I would have make these definitions, and then we can have a uh, break. So 
So again, we we have we'll make a definition of a kind of semi-simple part of our category, and we'll make the and then we'll have the full thing being the homotopy category. So we define the categorical spherical module semi-simple to be I C W F. So this is exactly the categorification of this element B W F times the Hecker category. And here we close under some ends. And this sits naturally. So this, this is inside the semi-simple guy. And then this is inside M sphere, which is triangulated and that's inside the Hecker category. So this is a sub and we define the anti-spherical semi-simple to be the Hecker category mod I C X such that X is not minimal. And this is a quotient of additive categories. So in my experience, quotients of categories are essentially always complicated, except in this case. So a quotient of an additive category is very easy. You just mod out by the ideal of things that factor through the thing you're quotienting out by. So this means that any map that factors through the additive subcategory generated by these things is zero. And then we define M anti-spherical to be the Hecker category. So this was semi-simple, modulo the triangulated category generated by these. Triangulated um, tight twist. And there's a tiny little thing that you can check, uh, which is that you might guess that, so here we passed to a homotopy category and we took a quotient of triangulated categories. Alternatively, we could take the homotopy category of this and the little lemma is that if we take KB of This does indeed agree with. Okay. And uh, what, what we're doing is just uh, categorifying in an incredibly naive way these realizations of the spherical and anti spherical modules that we've described by a casual elliptic theory. And so it should be very believable that what we get is um, has the correct arithmetic group. And that's the theorem, which is not difficult, and I won't discuss, is that um, so in the coming lectures, I'll need to be a, I'll need to say in much more detail what it means for something to be a module over a monoidal category. At the moment, I'll leave it as somewhat of a black box, is a right H module. And um, we have a canonical identification. Between M A is for and the Grothendi group, the appropriate
Okay. So the takeaway, I'm just taking the, I'm doing the spherical at the same time because it's um, useful to keep in mind, but it won't be nearly as important for us. So the thing to really remember is the spherical module. It's this, um, it's kind of semi-simple part is just a naive quotient of additive categories. And so now one finally knows what this object is up here, which, which is on the right-hand side of this equivalence. Okay. So in the next uh, hour, I'll start to discuss uh, in very broad terms, how A, B go about establishing this equivalence. So Jordi, mm -hmm. this, um, so this H and also this M spherical or anti-spherical, they have some, um, well, I don't know what to call it, uh, a lattic realization, maybe we can say, to the equivariant derived category in the first case, right, to the Iwahori, well, for the H to the Iwahori constructible chiefs on the affine flags, right? This was one of the conditions that you put for defining. There was, you know, you wanted the Hecke category that satisfies three conditions, right? Mm -hmm. And one of them was that there should be a sort of a natural map to the... Correct. Uh, I, I assume we have those also in the affine situation. Yes. And so can, can you tell us about, or maybe not now, maybe le about the... Um, the corresponding map for the M spherical and then whatever the commutative diagram is. Ah, yes, yes. I definitely plan to do this, yes. It's very important. Um, but roughly speaking, um, M spherical means some, um, something to do with the affine Grassmannian. I mean, essentially, Iwahori equivariant sheaves on the affine Grassmannian, and M anti spherical is Whittaker sheaves on the affine flag variety. Iwahori Whittaker sheaves on the affine flag variety. But it's definitely a, a, a problem in some sense that at this stage the objects look rather formal. Uh, so they will have a more uh, geometric manifestation in coming weeks. I have to say, I'm consistently amazed at how much of this story there is actually to explain. Whenever I start thinking, okay, I should have to explain that, or then 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 suddenly 10 weeks have gone. <laughs> Oh, I gather I had a question at the beginning and that you kind of answered and that was like is there a definitive end time uh, for the either the course or the uh, IFS so I guess the answer is we don't know yet yeah I think but for the course I want to at least get to I want to get pr through a proof of Akifar Bezra Kamnikov and uh, to understand the precise statement of Bezra Kamnikov's equivalence I think that's a reasonable goal and I think that that's achievable in probably, uh, I don't know, somewhere between six and ten weeks. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so let's uh, begin again. So this uh, is, I want to talk in very, this will be a kind of philosophical few, half an hour or something. So I just want to discuss in broad outline what it means to study kind of two representation theory. So that's the study of symmetries of categories. So I think that you can, uh, so what is, what is representation theory? Is the study of linear symmetry. I hope that that's not controversial. Uh, and what form does linear symmetry take? I think that we began when people first studied representation theory, linear symmetry was the symmetries involving groups. And then you have this uh, gradual realization that uh, studying representations of groups is the same thing as studying representations of group algebras. And then you realize that actually uh, there's very natural algebras that occur that aren't group algebras anymore, like Hecker algebras or enveloping algebras. So the basic objects here that we study are kind of groups algebras, etc. And the basic observation is kind of is that uh, group actions are difficult. But, um, become, but they become easier once we linearize. And I know some of you have heard me say this before, but I do find it very interesting historically. Uh, it took mathematicians an enormous amount of time to work out that a group was an, impor an important object in itself. Uh, so this began with Galois, Ruffini, etc. in the early part of the, um, in around about 1820, 1830. But even when one became aware that a group was an important concept, studying its representation theory is also a big step that took very good mathematicians a, a long time to realize. And now in the 20th century, you basically have representation theory kind of pervading um, um, theoretical physics and number theory and et cetera. Uh, two representation theory. is the study of symmetries of categories. Um, but we don't want to, when we, if I'd said that um, up in the representation theory that this is the study of symmetry, I would have been wrong because we really need linear and so we need uh, some kind of linear categories. Where linear might mean something as basic as being K linear, but probably means something more like additive, triangulated, Or abelian. 
Okay. We would like to be able to do one of the reasons that representation theory is so powerful is because we have linear algebra. So this means that we can add vectors and we can multiply them by scalars. And now one of the reasons that two representation theory is so good is that we have the categorical structure available. We can take kernels or we can add objects together or we can consider cones, etc. cetera. Uh, and a philosophy that I learned from Manin, so, is kind of in differential geometry, we kind of have G acting on a manifold and then we linearize this by considering G acting on the, let's say L2 functions on our manifold. So in algebraic geometry, if G acts on a variety, this variety might be projective, for example, so we don't really want to take uh, just the, the functions on X, um, and we might get, a, get around that by saying, okay, then we might take all the action on all the equivariant line bundles on X and get a whole host of representations, but which line bundles do you take, etc. And it's much more natural to say, that G acts on um, coherent sheaves on X or quasi-coherent sheaves on X. So the kind of moral is that sending X to quasi-coherent sheaves on X or coherent sheaves on X or the derived category of coherent sheaves on X um, can be thought of as a two linearization. Of X. So we replace the nonlinear object X by not a vector space, but by something that's um, a try that's so a category of a linear nature. Um, and if I'm allowed to make a side remark, I just found, so when we were discussing at lunch, I think, I can't remember what it was, maybe last Thursday, um, we discussed um, Manin's very first paper on motives. And um, this led to a Google search, which led to a more recent paper of Manin on, um, it's called something like, hidden motives and the variety of scientific ex experience. Uh, so this is a side remark. I just found this really beautiful and wanted to tell you. Uh, so what Manin points out is that if f is a, x is a sheaf, then early, so in the 1950s, approaches emphasized check coverings. Okay, so the idea now is that we, uh, we have our space and then we break up our space into pieces which are cohomologically simple and then we use some big complex to measure how these pieces are put together. That's the, that's the principle of Czech cohomology. But then Grothendieck
shifted in, in emphasis to injective resolutions. So now rather than breaking X up into pieces, what we do is we say, we, we take, we replace F by something or by a complex of things which are, um, are kind of contractible or something. And I, I just found it so beautiful. He says, if you look at this formula, you have two variables here. You have the nonlinear variable and you have the linear variable. And he explains this movement from here to here, emphasized by Grothendieck, as being a movement from the nonlinear variable to the linear variable. And just if we uh, come back up to what's going on up here, I'm sure I've told some of you the story before, but I, in third year, um, a student came up to me. I, so I was also in third year and said, um, I've been asked to show that the L2 functions, like big L2 of S1 is the same thing as little L2 of Z. And I told them, this question is clearly wrong. These, these spaces are clearly not the same. Um, and of course, the, what is going on here is Fourier series for the circle. Okay, so the isomorphism between big L2 of S1 and little L2 of Z is given by Fourier series. And this is the statement that once we linearize things, you can have very non-trivial and unexpected relations. And you can see all this world about equivalence of derived categories in algebraic geometry of coherent sheaves as being the statement that once we linearize, suddenly these spaces or categories can be related in highly non-trivial ways. Okay, so now I want to go back to our uh, long range hope. So this is a kind of long range hope, i.e. we will not realize this hope for basically the entire course. So Lin Wan says all separal, separable Hilbert spaces are isomorphic. It's true. Uh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> probably of the same dimension or something, no? Um, so we have two very interesting triangulated categories. We have D And the long range hope is that the natural symmetries of these two categories agree and yield um, the affine Hecker, Hecker category. So this is a precise analog of the Kajdan-Lussik proof of the statement of this on Grothendieck groups, where you prove that the affine Hecker algebra 
acts on these two modules in the same way. And therefore, you have an isomorphism of algebras. Okay. But I just want to point out that a priori, the symmetries on both sides appear rather different. So this is a short way of saying that we have a lot of work to do. So what acts on the right hand side, this is naturally a module over the affine Hecker category, but this is kind of nowhere to be seen on the left hand side. What acts naturally here? Well, rep of g check acts naturally here. For any representation of g check, we can get a g check equivariant line bundle on the Springer resolution, and we can tensor with that. Similarly, rep of gm acts uh, also equivariant line bundles. Act, etc. So I want to make um, this business precise. And I just want to um, do a brief notational interlude. So I want to be more precise about what, uh, what it means for a monoidal category to act on a category in future, future lectures, probably next lecture. But for the moment, just think that this is a monoidal category. An action just means that it's, it's a categorification of the notion of a ring acting on a module. So notational interlude. Are there any questions on this long range hope? Because I think it's very important, uh, at least have in your back in the back of your mind for the for the next few lectures. So the notational interlude is that uh, it will be useful to use the language of stacks. But we will basically do, do as, um, as Bezrel Kamnikov does, which is you use the language of stacks, but any stack that ever appears is a quotient of a quasi-projective variety by a linear algebraic group action. So all stacks Y quasi-projective modulo H linear algebraic, so affine algebraic. And the kind of two important points, so C, Emily's IFS talk, to quasi And the most important things that the most important kind of facts and these will be used repeatedly
is that um, quasi-coherent cheese on such a stack is just equivalent to H equivariant quasi-coherent cheese on Y and same with coherent cheese. And that this equivalence is completely canonical. So that's very important. We will use this all the time. And the other thing that we'll need we'll, that we'll use all the time, or at least I'm kind of thinking all the time, is that this map from y to y mod h is a principal h bundle. So what that means is that if I base chain, if I probe this by any other scheme, then I get um, a principal. Is a principal. And this is Cartesian. Now the really important basic observation which uh, makes this business here more precise is the following observation. Did that go too quickly? Complain if it did. I meant the slide, I didn't mean the... Uh... Okay, so the basic observation is firstly that quasi-coherent sheaves on y, so if y is a stack as above, then quasi-coherent sheaves on y and um, vector bundles on y are symmetric monoidal categories. And the second basic observation is that if I have any map of stacks then quasi-coherent sheaves on X is a module over quasi-coherent sheaves on Y by a so I want to act with the quasi-coherent chief on Y. And this is just defined to be, I pull this back and I tensor. So this is the basic observation. So Jordi, uh, mm -hmm. maybe just a remark that this is the categorification of the basic observation that if you have a, a map of sets from X to Y, then, um, then algebra of functions on X is a module over algebra of functions on Y. Exactly, under point-wise multiplication. Yeah, but what confuses me is why we're using convolution for this. I mean, somehow in the algebra world, we don't use convolution for this action. Oh, why we're using a, a fancy star? Yeah. Yeah, fancy star for me just means product in some, it's either an action or a product in a monodal category. It doesn't necessarily mean convolution. 
Oh. It's just because for me, tensor products a bit overloaded. Like if I wrote tensor product here, it might be the tensor product of coherent sheaves somehow. And I'm just saying this is a formal operation, which is given by something on the right that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the basic observation. And so now we get, we, we're doing lots of basic things at the moment. So the basic approach of Archipog Bezra Kamnikov is extremely beautiful. So for simplicity, I just want to ignore GM. So what do we what do we want? We want G check times GM. On M tilde, this is what we want. Is equivalent to M antisphere. Now, uh, we have the following, so I just want to ignore GM. So we have the following map of stacks. We have the following maps of stacks. Okay, so this is just obtained as a quotient. So there was another question in the chat, I think. Thank you. So we have a map from the spring of resolution to G check, and we have a map from G check to a point. These maps are G check equivariant, and so we get a map of these quotient stacks. But whenever I write down such a map of quotient stacks, if, you, if you're not happy with stacks, then you can just say, this is code for there is an equivariant map. Now, what this means is that we get a chain of symmetric monoidal categories. So we get quasi coherent sheaves here. And one can think about this as a family of, so this is a categorification of a family, so three symmetric algebras that are getting big, three commutative algebras that are getting bigger. Okay. So I have a reasonably easy algebra inside a bigger algebra inside a bigger algebra. And the basic observation is that if we expect such an equivalence to hold, then we definitely expect this to be a module over this. And we definitely expect this to be a module over this. And we definitely expect this to be a module over this. So if I call these A, B, and C, so we, um, we step by step
because that's the basic structure of the proof. We, so firstly, we, we construct the action here of this one. And this is via, this is um, gates Gree's central functors. Now, the next step here, that's very interesting because these two, these two categories have the same Grothendieck group. And so in Grothendieck groups, their difference is invisible. And what, uh, what the construction of B is, um, revolves around the um, nilpotent endomorphism, the monodromy. of um, nearby cycles. So in uh, the paper that Gates Greer wrote on the central sheaves, he writes that this construction provides these objects with a nilpotent endomorphism. And he says that this nilpotent endomorphism is invisible on growth in their groups, but Roman explains to me it has a deep geometric significance. And the deep geometric significance is precisely um, upgrading the action from, from this category to this category, which again is invertible, in, is invisible on growth index groups. And then C is Wakimoto, which um, I haven't discussed at all. Uh, who raised their hand? Uh. CL. Yeah, I raise my hand. Um, could, would you like to um, ask a question or make a comment? I, yeah. Um, so I thought the um, monodromy of nearby cycles is an isomorphism. Um, so it depends. So you have the monodromy, which is um, unipotent, and then you can take its logarithm and then you get a nilpotent endomorphism. So it's it's just it's more convenient in this language to view it as a nilpotent endomorphism, but if you want to take its exponential, then you'll get the um, the unipotent monodromy, which is an isomorphism. Okay, I see. Uh, so this is the basic approach. So you, you upgrade from here to here to here. And so now what you've got by acting on some very basic object inside here, we have a, a functor from here to here. And then you argue that this functor is an equivalence. Uh, so I just have a question. This is kind of um, this this puts some kind of ring structure on the on the Grothendieck group of anti-spherical module, right? Because we're identifying it with like what 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 is that? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the short answer is I've asked myself that question and I don't know. Mm -hmm. cool. Sorry, what was the question? So what Tony is saying is that what, what I've been out, so we, we do this step, step, step process and we get a functor from here to here. And then there's some beautiful argument that explains that this functor is an equivalence. Uh, so we get a, sorry. Ah. So maybe I'll, just to explain what Tony's saying, I'll take this to a new slide. So 
the end result of a whole lot of work that'll take us a few weeks is to explain that this symmetric tensor category acts on this. And now by action on, uh, on, uh, by action on one, we get a functor from, I mean, this should be, this should all be, so we get a functor from dbq co n tilde 2m antispherical. Okay, this is like, this is a module and we act on some very simple vector in this module and, and we get the whole we get the whole module and this gives us an isomorphism. Okay, so that's the basic proof of um, Arkhipov Ezra Kevnikov. But now what Tony's saying is that this is manifestly a symmetric monoidal category. And so this is two. And what the hell is that structure? And I don't know. I also guess the chance that Tony will run into Roman in the tea room at the moment is slim, which is a pity. So what you're saying is that it's more naturally just a free rank one module than an actual algebra. Correct. Uh, so there's 10 more minutes. Uh, I'm wondering whether I should. So I'll just say a few things about uh, monodal categories. Maybe we'll just stop for today. Um, I think that's enough to digest for today. So next week, uh, what I want to explain, I just want to explain what it means for something to be a module over a monodal category, and I want to give a whole lot of examples, just so that we get used to the concept. And the most, um, the nicest example that we'll discuss is the modules over the representations of SL2. So representations of SL2 is a symmetric monodal category. And it's very interesting to ask, what can you say about a category which is acted on by the representations of SL2? So we're kind of looking at representations of representations of SL2. So this will be next week. And then the week after, after we'll return to this world.